about 1951 was the time that Rod Serling more or less felt about as fed up as he could possibly get with many of the very mundane things that he had to churn out as a staff writer at WLW. So he turned in his notice but continued to remain with the station on a freelance basis, and that is when he wrote this particular show, It Happens to You. Now, all during this time, Rod Serling was continuing to write for television, turning in various television dramas as scripts to the various people in New York who were running things like Old Craft Playhouse and Philco, things like that. Great story about Rod. He was turning in so many of these shows, and so many of them were being produced, that when he was called in for a production meeting, he had to say, well, I'm not going to be able to make it for another 24 hours. And one of the directors there said, well, why? Why can't you be here today? And he finally said, well, because I have to fly in. They all thought he was a New York writer. Little did they know that Rod Serling was still in Cincinnati, but what he was doing was very smart. He was trying to build enough of a name for himself as a writer that he would finally have the wherewithal to move to New York once his career really took off. And that's what he did around 1955 or so. But we're going to go back about two years earlier, from October 2nd of 1953, for this broadcast, something that hasn't been heard for nearly 50 years. It happens to you. Your narrator, Peter Grant. The time, October 1953. The place, New York City, USA. Your name is Dan Shevlin. This is your story. It happens to you. This is what we choose to call the human comedy. It takes place in a round theater called the Globe. Continents and oceans are the sets. You and the millions who share your existence are the cast. The lives you live are the plays, and tonight you're a detective named Shevlin. Your Achilles' heel is a memory. With you, it's a memory of a childhood game that became a reality, a game called You Be the Bad Guy. This is New York City. Manhattan Island, purchased from the Indians in the 1600s, molded, girded, riveted into a giant steel and concrete city with eight million people. You're one of them, Detective Dan Shevlin. And standing there in front of the mirror shaving, you listen to the sounds of the city outside, waking up, stretching, coming to life, to a discordant early morning symphony of garbage cans, milk bottles, traffic, and the familiar voices of the kids in the hall playing cops and robbers. The bang your dead age, when death takes turns and tragedy is play-acting, that glorious time of being a kid, what you used to be an eon ago, when your badge came out of a cereal box and your gun was a pointed finger, an eon ago, Dan Shevlin, remember? Hey, Jamie, you up? Coffee's done. Yeah, I'm up. <laughs> the kids? <laughs> you'll be the bad guy. No, you'll be the good guy. No, I'll be the good guy. Oh, what a beautiful morning. It ain't. Come on, up and at them. Get your coffee. Say, you know, it wasn't so long ago that we were playing cops and robbers, too. You know something? Looks like you're still playing it. Ah, the shoulder holster detective. <laughs> tools of my trade, kid brother. You can have it. A little peaked this a.m.? A little mad on, maybe? What's the matter? A tough night last night? The usual. Ever work in a hardware store? There's worse jobs, Jamie. Sure. Dog catcher. Cleaning out hen houses. Wearing a tin badge for 30 years so you can retire 30 bucks a month. Well, that tin badge hasn't done too bad filling your till the past few years. I suggested you get on the force. Me? On the force? You got rocks, Daniel. I'm low on luck, but I'm not that low. You're 24 years old, Jamie. One of these days, you're going to have to stop singing the blues and find yourself. Six jobs in six months. What are you trying to do? Set a record? 
What's this? What's what? Miss Doe on the dresser. You got paid off last night, didn't you? Make that seven jobs in six months. Now, what happened this time? Get your thumb caught in the cash register? Uh, the owner was always jawing at me. I decided I'd switch jobs. This one didn't appeal to me. You better switch stories. That one doesn't appeal to me. Now, what do you do? Oh, look around. I got time. Hand me those cigarettes, will you? Thanks. I might try writing a book. The mentality of a cop. Personal observations of my big brother, Dan. That'd make dull stuff. Don't kid yourself. Cops are complex characters. Look at yourself. Remember the cops and robbers we used to play? You always made me be the bad guy. And instead of shooting me, you'd talk me into changing. <laughs> you got a deal, you know, Dad. You're the only kid who never had to quit playing his favorite game. Old Peter Pan Shevlin in his Never Never Land of Badges and Beats. Where's that coffee? Here. You got a nasty mouth at times, you know. What is that? A misdemeanor, officer? <laughs> you bum. Hey, let go of my hand. <laughs> Come on now. Hey, I gotta go. It's getting late. See you tonight, huh? Sure, Lieutenant. Don't take any wooden crooks. <laughs> I love the way you straighten that badge. Hey, leave me your extra one. I'll, I'll polish it up for you. Oh, you're too kind. Hey, we'll lead out tonight. Have a little talk about your plans. See you later. Sure, big brother. Lecture me some more. Morning, Pete. Morning, Dan. Hey, hey, Lieutenant, remember me? No, don't tell me. It's Mr. Schultz. What are you doing these days? Getting booked on pickpocket charges. All right, back to work, Mr. Schultz. I want to get this done. Your last place of regular employment. Schultz, your last place of employment. Lieutenant Shevlin, you're looking at the greatest miscarriage of justice in Sacco and Manzetti. I'm a babe, Lieutenant, like a lamb. I'm innocent. Somebody give me a promo. Lieutenant, talk about circumstantial evidence. I am minding my own business. I'm standing in line, waiting to get into a lecture. This, uh, this person runs me in. Now, I ask you, where is the justice in this? That's the whole story? All but one minor detail. He had his hand in some guy's hip pocket, transferring his wallet. Oh, I am nearsighted. I thought I was reaching in my own pocket. <laughs> Honest, this is justice. A citizen stands in line waiting to get into a lecture, and he gets snapped. What was the name of the lecture? Get ready to flip. The little man was going to hear all about Keith. <laughs> so don't laugh, you, you ignoramus. You don't even know what a kid says. <laughs> don't ask me no more questions. I know my rights. I want a lawyer. You know, you don't need a lawyer, Schultz. With your talents, what you need is an agent. <laughs> Dan, when you're free. Shut it. Who's your friend? Schultz. I used to pick him up regularly when I had a beat. I thought he was your father. Such affection, Shevlin. Or maybe it's just nostalgia for the good old days when you wore brass buttons and took home half a salary. You get my point? I take it something's not sitting well on you. That's a conservative observation. Considering if I had a celluloid collar on now, it'd be up in smoke. Shevlin, you worry me. Usually when I get a good cop and promote him to plain clothes, I have to sit on him so he doesn't use his hands on prisoners. You... I get the other extreme. I get sweetness and light and psychology. I get a social work routine. It, consider their home life. It, take in account their new environment. It, there's no such thing as a bad boy. Shevlin, you enforce the law. You make the arrests. You forget the causes and stick to the effects. If a guy's off his rocker, a good alienist will figure it out. Those things are not your concern. You got a nice 14-hour-a-day job picking up hoods and tracing clues. You want a campaign for brotherly love? Make it a hobby and keep it away from here. Okay, so I'm on the block, Cap. But I don't know why. I'll tell you. 
A week and a half ago, you picked up a kid named Reardon. Yeah, I stole some clothes. That's the boy. Did you bring him in? Write it up, get a conviction? No, you didn't. That was too easy. Two hands, no psychiatry. The good lieutenant wants to play nurse. So you persuade the storekeeper not to prefer charges. It's the kid's second offense, and all he gets is elected. He was 15 years old. His old man lived out of a box. I don't care if his old man was the U.S. senator from North Dakota and tried to bring back prohibition. The kid was caught cold with a hundred bucks worth of stolen property. All right. I may have been a little too lenient. Not little and not lenient. That was the stupidest, empty-headed bit I've ever seen. I just took a chewing from the D.A. Captain Vansky, he says. What's wrong with your department, he says. You know why he said that? Because your little altar boy figured a police force is a big Sunday school full of flabby-headed jerks who wouldn't use a set of nuts on Hitler. So he tried his luck a little further. You know what it was this time? Homicide, Shepman. First-degree murder. Murder? Spelled with a big bloody M. You did the kid a big favor. You kept him out of stir for an old clothes wrap so he could get 99 years for the big one. And I'm on the phone one hour and 35 minutes trying to explain to the D.A. why one of my detectives is a lotus eater and let the kid get away so he could kill. Sorry, Dan. We're going to have to change the color of your badge. Wipe off the lieutenant. He's playing detective now. Demotion, huh? What did you expect, a medal? The D.A. was all for putting you back in uniform. I stuck my neck out this far because usually you're a good cop. That's all. And tell Pete to slip it to that old man. What's his name? Schultz. I want a big conviction on the basis of previous arrests. And I want this department to get up on its haunches and roar for a change. And one other thing. Get a line on Frank Wiley. You making book again? We got a tip his face is dirtier than that. Get a line on him. See what else he's mixed up in. Right. And Dan. Yeah? Don't bother putting this guy on a couch for a psychoanalysis. If it gives you trouble, get tough. What would you suggest, a whip? Danny boy, I'd get rid of the chip if I were you. When I say tough, I don't mean brutal. I don't go in for the rubber hose treatment, you know that. But wise up. Find a happy medium. And if it means handcuffs, use them. Yeah, sure. (laughs) Yes! All of you guys, I'm telling you, I'm cueing you. None of you will have a job because I got friends in high places. <laughs> Very high places. <laughs> Grandpa, the highest place you ever was was the top rung of a bar stool. Yeah? Well, uh... Oh, Shevlin. Here, you guys. Here is the only decent guy in the whole department. Shut up, Blazes. I was. Man, <laughs> you could break a man's back that way. Easy. Uh, l- 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 lieutenant... They this ain't like you. It isn't a lieutenant, Pop. Check your program. This is the last act. Pete, Captain Vansky would like you to slip it to the old gentleman here. That's SOP from here on in. Jonesy, Shevlin. They got the file out on Frank Wiley. W-Y-L-I-E. Yeah. Shoot it up to me. Right. Mr. Schultz, you want to register a complaint? Why, no. The nice front, if you don't mind. You're all taken care of, Grandpa. Let's go. Court convenes at ten. Just remember, this is going to hurt you more than it is me. Let's go. Hello, kid. Hello. What's the matter? Somebody get away? Yeah. A lieutenancy. (laughs) Took off like a big bird, streamlined. You look it. Yeah, 12 years in the force. Year and a half lieutenant. Suddenly I'm not tough enough for him. What happened? Nah, I let a kid off a week or so ago. He crosses me and commits murder. That's supposed to show something. It shows you're a lousy judge of character. That's what it shows. You know something, big brother? What? I'm not surprised. Meaning what? Meaning you've always been too mushy to be a good cop. You got where you are because you're smart. And you're plugged. But sooner or later, they were going to find you out. They had to. It's like... When you and I were kids and played cops and robbers, you never went bang, bang. You tried to lecture. Made a dumb game. I never liked it. I'm so sorry. 
Look, I, I got a couple of calls I have to make. Uh, open some cans, will you? I haven't time to eat out. I'll be back in about an hour or so. Can't, Dan. I've got an appointment myself. Better grab a bite while you're out. What's this appointment? Blonde or brunette? This happens to be legitimate. About a job. It's been a full day, then. I'll see you later, Jamie. Information? The residence of Frank Wiley. That's right. Frank Wiley. Wait a minute. I want to write that down here. What was it? Fletcher 7... Four, five, seven, eight. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. <laughs> While you're working your beat, Dan Shevlin... Your brother Jamie is walking down the center aisle of the local arena where two stalwart young gentlemen with flat noses and truck garden ears are demonstrating the manly art. Jamie's eyes, however, are not on the brilliantly lit ring. They're resting on a squat, pig-eyed man sitting in a second-row seat. Hi. You Frank Wiley? Uh, that depends. Who wants to know? I'm Shevlin. I phoned you about a job. Yeah? Sit down. What do you room at price fights nowadays? Television, you know. Kid in black. Fast boy. Telegraphs his punch. See him drop his left? Uh, expert, huh? So, you want to work for me? You any relation to Dan Shevlin? Brother. Brother? Aren't you begging trouble? I don't sell frozen custards, you know. I'm in the hijacking business. Deal me in. Nobody said you were playing yet. Come on, get up on your feet, you big palooka. This guy is the only fighter who has to be carried both in and out of the ring. You see, kid, I gotta be choosy about my employees. How do I know you ain't gun shy? <laughs> That'd be like a soda jerk allergic to whipped cream. <laughs> Get it? Gun shy, allergic to... First lesson, kid. I said something funny. You laugh. That's part of the arrangement. I don't get it. Then maybe you'll get this. Handy, huh? You haul out the slap, I catch your hand, now you got a knife in your throat. I think fast, Mr. Wiley. I'm always prepared. Turn around, kid. Oh, I get it. You spot a bodyguard behind you. Check. And that thing poking through the slats in your chair is a gun. I'm always prepared, too. But you aren't bad. Where'd you learn to use that shiv? You handle it nice. My brother. He's a big theory man. He knows how to do anything. With a knife, wire, set of nuts. But it's all theory. He don't put it to use, huh? He's got a soul, Mr. Wiley. Very sensitive. But when he got it, he used up the family quota. You're different, huh? What are you, kid? The cold-blooded killer type? Try me. I think I will. I'm short-handed. There's just one other thing. Where you been? It took a while. Truck driving... Hardware store, that sort of thing. Then I got wise. I don't want to jingle coins. I want to count bills. I think you'll do okay. When can you start? I just punched in. Good. Take off the knife and make yourself at home, kid. Now, get what I'm saying. This is the set. Dinner. Try to get me? Three times the past half hour. We got a tip. Nice job. The party mm -hmm. thinks the old Metropolitan Warehouse. You talk to Wiley? 
Not yet. Good bet he figures in this. Phone him up. We can cut out his first at home alibi anyway. Because I don't think he'll be there. Here's his phone number. Fletcher 74578. Fletcher 745... What's the matter? Didn't you get it? Well, I, I must have written it down before. It's on a paper here by the phone. Fletcher 74578. All right. I'm sending two cars down there. One in front down the block, the other in the alley. Watch for them. And Danny, deal this one close to the undershirt. I don't want these fish getting away. Jack, see you later. <sighs> That's funny. I must have written it down, but well, I'm sure I didn't. Nobody else could have... Well, why would Jamie call that number? Why, I wonder? Why? All right, pipe down, you guys. You all get booked. We don't play no favorites. Nice work. Thank you, Captain. Whoever's stool sure headed on target. It was the Metropolitan Warehouse. We caught him on the way out. No trouble? Well, there's a fourth guy. He shot the watchman, and then he hightailed it out of there. Lieutenant Chevlin went after him. Okay, bet him down. We'll write him up in the morning. How about a mouthpiece, Vansky? We still got it coming. If I gave you birds what you had coming, you'd be hanging by broken thumbs from a red-hot pipe. Now, go ahead. Let him phone up. If Chevlin gets back, I want to see him. <laughs> Welcome home, Dan. Where you been? What's the matter? I don't know. What's the matter? You, you look like the last rose, kid. Like, like somebody died. Somebody did die. A night watchman with a bullet in his head. That's too bad. But that's your business. Well, all of a sudden, it becomes personal business. All of a sudden, it hits close to home. It's in the family. You, you knew this guy, this, this watchman? No. No, but I'm closely related to the person who killed him. Let go, Dan! What's this you had in your belt, Jamie? A gun? Yeah, two bullets gone, the barrel hot. I thought it was you behind me. You're a hard guy to shake. Why, Jamie? Why? You dumb, stupid, crazy kid. If you needed dough, all you had to do was whistle. If you were in a jam, I, I was there all the time. Oh. All of a sudden, the bottom falls out. I got a living, walking nightmare. I don't get it, kid. Not you. Not Jamie. I don't get it. Why, Jamie? Why? One day, you're a light-headed kid who thinks about dates... Next thing I know, you're a killer, a hood. One of the dirty, cold-blooded rats I've spent half of my life putting in jails. Dan, shut up. Shut up. Jamie, what do you got? I wasn't smart, Dan. Putting a gun on a bed where I could reach it. Put it down, Jamie. Can't, Dan. Jamie, give me that gun. Get back in here. Can't, Dan. Okay. That's more like it. I got a gun. Now you got a gun. Even Stephen. Now we can play cops and robbers, Danny. Like old times, huh? I'll be the bad guy. You'll be the cop. Jamie, come back up off those stairs. Uh-uh. Can't, Dan. Listen to me, Jamie. Listen, I'm soft. I hate to hurt people. It's what's held me down. I see too much good in everybody. But listen, Jamie. I got a job. And right now, you're not my brother. You're just anybody with a gun. You're just uh, another menace. Come on down, Danny. Cops and robbers. You stop. Jamie, put down that gun. No. You put yours down. Jamie. 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 Jam
Jamie kid. Come on, Dan. Play the game. Don't chicken on me. Don't make me ashamed, are you? Jamie. Jamie, I... I can't. Come on, Dan. If you don't, I will. Make way, make way. Pipe down, everybody. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. This uh, one from the warehouse? Yeah. Put a blanket around it. A, a blanket? That's what I said, a blanket. I went in comfortable. Uh, Lieutenant, he's comfortable. He's never going to be uncomfortable again. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I didn't type a but... report, will you, Pete? Sure. Sure, Dad. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, Dad. Name is... Was... James Shetland. Age 24. Height, 5 foot 11. Occupation. Or was it... Let's say clerk. Shot while attempting escape. Victim was suspect in armed robbery. It was an open homicide. Oh, my. But I don't see why all the time gotta be the bad guy. Victim pronounced dead on a rifle. Gunshot wound. Oh, Abdomen. Dear. Sign it. Sign it. Shetland. Detective. Third precinct. Oh, Jamie. Oh, God. Jamie. Jamie. So you sit there, Detective Shetland, pounding a fist against the desk. Brutal, hard smashes. Fruitless, frustrated smashes. Those of a man suffering the knife cut of tragedy. You sit there crying. The broken, harsh sobs of a man who knows that men can't cry. But do. Outside, the night dissolves into dawn. Once again, eight million players prepare the new act of the human comedy. For you, a life has ended, a play is finished. And from deep within the sphere of your sorrow, a memory has been born. This is the story, Detective Shevlin. It happens to you. Written and produced by Rod Serling. Direction, Charles Lemmers. Next week, another story out of the lives we lead. A girl, a love affair, a tragedy. You live it next week when it happens to you. <laughs> Rod Serling's It Happens to You exclusively on the big broadcast. And Mark, listening to that and knowing the Twilight Zone as well as I do, I couldn't help but think, but this is Rod Serling, 
early in his career, mind you, but he's really developing as a writer. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that Plain Dealer writer Bill Sloat spoke to us about when we played a few of these excerpts for him, was that Serling's style, the crisp, terse, staccato dialogue, is already in place at this early date. But really, it's a great treat to be able to present for the first time in nearly half a century this previously lost episode of It Happens to You, written and produced by Rod Serling on tonight's big broadcast.